Hi folks, welcome to this video on altitude training. So there's a prime example of um, an athlete, a cyclist performing something like this. What we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, exactly what constitutes altitude training. Why do people go to such extremes of altitude training? But are there any potential side effects? So it could well be a discuss, discuss whether you know, the, the benefits of going to altitude and training altitude are outweighed by the issues that are caused by altitude training. So that's what we're going to try and look at very, very quickly, okay? So what is it then? Well, to be true altitude training, we need to be training at at least 2,000 metres above sea level or 8,000 feet. And we need to usually train for a minimum of 30 days at these altitudes in order for us to see any beneficial effects. The reason we need to be this high is because the partial pressure of oxygen is much lower uh, at, at, at these heights. Now, what is the benefit of having that lower partial pressure? Because sometimes the thinking is, if I'm going, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get endurance benefits by training at altitude, but there's very little oxygen at, at 2,000 metres above sea level. So how can that actually improve my aerobic uh, capacity, aerobic performance? Well, what it does, because there's so little oxygen, it stimulates the EPO, the erythropoietin, in your blood to produce more haemoglobin, to produce more red blood cells, in an attempt to try and grab as much of that oxygen as possible. There isn't much, so we need to try and grab as much as we can. And in order to do that, we need higher concentrations of haemoglobin in the blood. So by training at these altitudes, we end up producing more haemoglobin. Now it costs a lot of money, it's time away from your family, so what are, the, what are the benefits? Why go do it? Well, as we've already mentioned, we're going to increase haemoglobin levels in the blood. Remember, haemoglobin carries oxygen in the blood and transports oxygen. We're also going to increase myoglobin levels, and if you think back, myoglobin is what stores oxygen in the muscles. So I can now carry more oxygen in the blood, and I can now carry more oxygen in the muscles as well. Those two things added together, I now have an increased oxygen carrying capacity. I can hold, transport and store more oxygen inside the blood and inside the muscle tissue. That's going to lead me to delay obla. So I'm going to go into lactate threshold later. I can work for harder without building or accumulating lactic acid levels, which is a massive advantage as a distance runner. I can work just below my lactate threshold for longer. And the benefits of all this are going to last up to six to eight weeks. So I can do this type of training before the Olympics and then come down, get used to the air conditions at the Olympic Games and I'll still be carrying a lot of those benefits. Mo Farah, for example, when the London 2012 Olympic opening ceremony was taking place, I believe he was still training at altitude in South Africa. So, you know, he wanted to leave it in sort of very last point to come from South Africa at altitude to, to compete so you maintain as many of those benefits as possible. Why? Well now we're going to look at the potential issues with altitude training. So I've just moved that picture across so and I've, I've titled this bit effectiveness. So how effective really is it? These are the performance improvements that people see through training altitude but you've got to wear that up against these things here. We've just said the benefits can last up to six to eight weeks. So why did Mo Farah leave it till very, very late to come from altitude to compete at London 2012? Well, even though they can last for up to six to eight weeks, the benefits start to be lost within a few days of returning to sea level. So again, why did Mo Farah stay there? Because he wanted to re sort of reduce the amount of benefits he lost by you know to an absolute minimum. Okay, it's not a case of you carry all the benefits up until six to eight weeks and then you just suddenly lose them overnight. You'll start to lose them within a few days and they're pretty much all gone by the time you get to the six to eight week mark. There's also the issue of time away from your family. You're going for a month at least away from your family. And Mo Far again, an altitude trainer, says about the demands, time away from his family. He's got daughters, he's got, you know, a wife, but he doesn't get to see them that much. So there are issues there. There's an issue of altitude sickness as well. A lot of people report nausea, dizziness, lightheadedness, as you would expect when you suddenly go to an environment where there's much less oxygen than what you're used to. So are you really going to train effectively when you're feeling sick? Well, the answer is no, you're not. And this final point comes into this at least 30 days thing. For the first few days at altitude, your training is going to be a very, very low intensity. The reason being is because of that altitude sickness. 
you're not going to be able to cope. There's very little oxygen. You're trying to force your body to make more haemoglobin, but in those first few days, it won't produce any more haemoglobin. So you'll have a very, very low obla. You will build up lactic acid very, very easily. You will get out of breath very, very easily. So again, you know, the training is going to be of a very low quality in the first few days. And because there's pros and cons, there's now a new way of thinking, okay? And it's called train low, recover high. Now, what you do is you train at sea level, and that's what we mean by train low, but then you recover at altitude, and you do it using one of these things. And this thing is called a hypoxic tent. You know, those of you that do about sports injuries and watch the sports injuries video will remember a hypoxic tent. It recreates the conditions at altitude. So this lady here, okay, has just been doing work on the athletics track at sea level. So she hasn't been training at altitude, but as soon as she's finished her training session, she goes into this tent where an air filter deliberately lowers the concentration of oxygen inside that tent. So it recreates, it lowers the partial pressure. So it recreates the altitude conditions. That makes sense. Think about it. When does your, tr when does your body make all of its adaptations? It's not during training. It's in your recovery in between training sessions. So you train at sea level, then you recover at altitude, but you can recreate the altitude conditions in a hypoxic tent. Now that keeps all the problems that we've just mentioned, it keeps them away. You're not having to spend time away from your family, you can put one of these up in your house. You're not having to go there for 30 days, you can now stay and train at home. You're not going to have altitude sickness and your training quality is not going to be lower because you're not training at altitude anymore, you're training at sea level, you're just recovering at altitude. So this is a new way of thinking in terms of um, in terms of altitude training, but it will have the same benefits as we've just mentioned on the previous slide. It will increase hemoglobin and myoglobin. It will delay obla. So it'll have all those benefits that we've just mentioned. It will increase your oxygen carrying capacity. So there are all the topics, and there are all that's all the theories surrounding altitude training. Hope uh, you found this video useful, folks.